Hello, and welcome to CMC Presents, a series of chamber music vignettes for our community. My name is Lisa Whitfield, and I'm a violist who usually comes to the conference in week three. Today, I have picked six points that I would like to discuss with the CMC community. These are things that a lot of folks have heard me discuss in coaching, but they're also things that I feel can be generalized to string players, keyboard players, woodwind players, brass players, and even percussion players, all of the instruments that would contribute to a chamber music experience. The first thing I really would like to discuss today is getting rid of one particular adjective that I have had a lot of experience with personally in my life, but also in teaching my students. I would like to suggest that we as a community and individuals get rid of the negative narrative that goes on in our heads about our own playing. I personally have struggled with this for many years. It's easy to say that something is bad. It's easy to say that something sounds bad if it doesn't come out the way you'd like it to. I always suggest to my students, instead of saying something was bad, tell me what you didn't like about it. Tell me how it fell short of your expectations. Think about how it doesn't fit the narrative of what you're doing. Because only then can you actually fix what it is that's wrong. Saying that something's bad doesn't fix it. Saying what it needs to be gives you an idea of how to make it the thing it needs to be. Intonation, tone, sound production, all of those things can be worked on technically, can be practiced, and can be improved. But most of all, they can be improved by improving our attitude about ourselves and our colleagues. The second thing I'd like to talk about briefly is recordings. A lot of the participants at the Chamber Music Conference listen to recordings, and I do highly recommend that you hear recordings of the pieces you are performing, playing, rehearsing, and being coached in. That's a great idea. Those are things I do myself. However, don't aim to play like the recording. Aim to hear the recording and let it inform you as to how things go. But don't try to emulate the recording. I remember hearing recordings of William Primrose when I was younger and learning solo literature as a violist. And I remember for a moment thinking to myself, not only that I was never going to sound like Primrose, but that I didn't want to. It's not that I didn't like what he did. It's not that I didn't like what any of the other performers I listened to do. It's just that I wanted to sound like me. As a musician, I had my own unique voice. I had things to say that I wanted to say. So go for it. Say what you have to say. Use those recordings to inform you in terms of who has the predominant voice, who has a secondary voice. And in terms of tempo or issues of pitch or dynamics, but don't try to play like a recording. Play like the individual that you are. The third thing is something that is very, very important to me personally as a coach, but also as a chamber music performer. And that is the idea of eye contact. I tend to be pretty intense with my eye contact during performances, particularly in parts that I've learned well. I always like to know who it is I'm playing with. I always like to encourage communication across 
an ensemble, to have the collective breath to begin the ensemble playing somewhere in the middle of the group, even though the players are sitting in various places around that. I use the, the eye contact and the breath to come together in the middle of all of that, to look at each other and breathe together, to be a unit. I personally have my own issues for wanting to have a lot of eye contact. I have, I have difficulty reading. I've always had difficulty reading. I didn't learn until I was in college that I have dyslexia. And I've worked very, very hard on reading things correctly and learning things by heart, by ear, so that I could get out of my part and not be a slave to the notes on the page, but be able to look up at my colleagues and play with them. That for me was my liberation from a negative, from a problem. But it also turned out to be really, really great because chamber music is about that connection between players, among players. And I really want to encourage you guys, get out of the part as much as you can. Learn it, enjoy it, live it, and then enjoy the the, the passion and, and the joy of living it with someone else. It's such an amazing feeling when people are playing together and they're looking at each other and they're enjoying the line that they're playing together. That's one of my favorite parts of chamber music. Along with this is what it's like to prepare a chamber music part in a vacuum. Over the years, that I've worked at the conference, a lot of people assume that the first violin has the melody all the time. The flute or oboe have the melody all the time. The trumpet all the time. That there is a soprano high voice that will always have the melody. And they tend to get tasked with a lot of heavy lifting for leading I am of the opinion that sometimes the lead voice, the melodic voice, is not the best voice to do the leading. Sometimes it's the lowest voice. Sometimes it's one of the inner voices. An example of this, one time I was asked by a group of participants to come and play the Brahms clarinet quintet with them. And there were three violists who were interested in doing it. Um, and rather than have them tell the other two that they shouldn't, I wanted us to rotate in and out of the viola chair. And the other two violists and a few of the other players were complaining about the viola part and how the viola part really is uninteresting or boring. And I tasked the group with trying to play a particular passage without the viola. Needless to say, things fell apart kind of quickly. And I know I'm a violist and this sounds biased, but bear with me for a moment. I then went into that particular situation and sat down and played the part. And I said, I'm not gonna play too loud, but I just want you to hone in on what I'm doing for a second. It was a rhythmic part that went between the two and the three that were going on in different instruments. And because of what the part was doing, the other players were able to hone in on it and go, wait a minute, I can play this now because I can hear what the viola's doing. And that totally debunked the myth that there is only one important voice at any given moment a lowly little inner voice part in very heavy air quotes was actually the thing that was driving the rhythmic pulse of an important part of the second movement of this piece. And it held the group together. Chamber music has no unimportant parts. A piece of chamber music without all of the parts that were written for it is not complete without any of those parts. They all need to be there. They all have a function. They all have a job. and They are all important in their own way. So when you're preparing your part, remember, 
there's nothing unimportant about it. When you go to learn the notes, look at the other parts. Where are you playing in octaves or thirds or sixths or other intervals that might be tricky to tune? Where are you the predominant voice? Where are you a backup voice? A lot of my participants will tell you that I have a tendency to say, that's Diana Ross and you guys get to be the Supremes. Sometimes you're the lead singer and sometimes you're a doo-wop girl and that's totally okay. But the doo-wop girls have to be together. Think of Gladys Knight and the Pips. I love Gladys Knight and the Pips. Gladys Knight's voice is amazing, but the visual of watching that group perform, so much of it is the choreography and harmony and call and response that comes from the Pips. Gladys Knight by herself is awesome, but Gladys Knight and the Pips was amazing. And I wanna see that. And sometimes in chamber music, you want to hear that. You don't just want to hear Gladys Knight. You want to hear what the pips are doing too. So if your job is to be a pip, be the best pip you can be. I've sort of combined things four and five on that. So the last thing I want to talk about and this is very particular to my job as a violist, but this could also be any other instrument or any other part that's used to being an inner voice, a low voice, a voice that they don't think is really very important. What happens when you get the melody? Anyone who's worked with me will tell you that I always talk about violists doing something I call the viola scoop. If I'm playing within a group, I'm going to look within the group. I'm going to look, say I'm in a quartet and the cellist is to my right. I'm gonna look at the cellist. If the first violin is right across from me, I'm gonna look at the first violin. If the second violin is to the left of the first violin, I'm going to look across the quartet and see that person. If there's a pianist, I'm going to look back at the pianist. But if I'm the person with the predominant voice. If I had the melody, I owe it to the audience to be able to hear me. And the viola has the worst possible position in any quartet because the F holes are facing the wrong way. So what I tend to do is when I'm in the group, I'm facing in, I'm leaning in, I'm playing to the group. When I have the predominant voice, I lean back, I scoot my F holes out and I play for my audience. I trust the rest of the group will follow me, will come with me, will listen to me. And then I come back. Sometimes we go in and out of being predominant. Sometimes we go in and out of importance or our role within a group. Sometimes the cello has the melody and the viola has the bass line. Sometimes the viola is with the oboe, but sometimes the viola is with the bassoon. Sometimes the violin is with the flute, and sometimes the violin will be with the piano. You have to know where are you supposed to stand up? Where are you supposed to stand back? And where are you supposed to sit down? A lot of that you can tell from reading a score you can see where the melodic lines are. You can see where they're handed off. You can see how eye contact between players can make that even more effective in a performance, either by looking at someone to hand them the melody that you're finishing in order for them to go on, or by looking at them so you can play that melody together and sing together. All of these things are incredibly important to all groups of instruments. And it's easy for us to misunderstand how another instrument works and not know exactly how to play together. One thing I find very important as well is to understand 
that just because I play a stringed instrument doesn't mean I don't need to breathe. Brass and woodwind players must breathe in order to produce sound. That's pretty simple as a concept. If we think that we don't need to do that, we're going to have a very difficult time playing with our wind playing brethren. So what I like to do is I like to think of myself as a wind player and think, how do I breathe through this phrase? How do I make my bow breathe through this phrase? Is doing the bowing that makes me comfortable making it more difficult for a wind player to do their job and for us to do that job together? Sometimes we have to put ourselves in the shoes of the other in order to play together. So if I'm playing something, say, with a bassoon or an oboe or a trumpet or French horn, I watch them and I try to breathe with them in the way that they breathe. This also references another video that you've seen by my colleague Sheila Reinhold, who talked about giving an effective cue and how you breathe. A lot of breathing is something that we can learn as string players and pianists a tremendous amount from wind players. How they breathe and how they cue is so completely organic to what they do. And we need to learn to breathe more like them in order to do what we need to do musically, not only to play with wind players, but even to play amongst ourselves as string or keyboard players. It's incredibly important how much we can learn from each other and how much we can grow musically by emulating instruments that we might think have nothing to do with who we are or how we play. I think that that's about all from me today. I miss you all very much. And I'd like to thank you for watching. You can find out more information about the conference at cmceast.org. That's c-m-c-e-a-s-t dot o-r-g, which is our website. I miss you. Enjoy your summer. And as always, happy music making.